Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Kirill is my name, and you're watching the Long Story Short, our own local ISK podcast where we invite teachers to learn about them as personalities and walking experiences. Today, my guest is going to be a great teacher that has been with us for two years but has already conquered fame and love from his students. Teacher of DP Economics, CAS, coordinator and TOK teacher, Mr. Bruce Zemo. And his story is not going to economize on words. Montana, you put some Montana on a shoe and I'll eat it. <laughs> well, that, that I call preparation. <laughs> so what? You could travel faster than other people, or you could. Is history made by individuals or by groups of people? There are at least two truths, which means the absolute truth doesn't exist. Apes don't read philosophy. He goes, yes, they do, Otto. They just don't understand what they're reading. Mm. Mm. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Today, my guest, as being said, is Mr. Bruce Zemel, ISK teacher of DP Economics, TOK, and also the CAS coordinator. Mr. Zemel, good day. Very Thank nice you to see me. you here. Well, welcome for coming. <laughs> You're one of the first guests, so to say, the pioneers of ISK podcasting, and we hope to make this a tradition, and you go down in history of ISK and those millions and millions of views, which you are, of course, going to receive. <laughs> We'll see. So, Mr. Zemo, the goal of our podcast is simple enough. We want to learn about teachers, not only about, not only as teachers, but as people, personalities, and walking experiences, so to say. My first question is simple enough. Please tell our fellow viewers who who are you, where do you come from. That means hometown, school, and probably first university. Oh, who am I? <laughs> is that the question we're always trying to, uh, of course, figure out and never managing to answer? You no, know, I grew up in Western Canada, the city of Winnipeg, which is not unlike Kazan. Actually, it's farm country. It's flat, lots of rivers, that sort of thing. Um, grew up there. It was a great place to grow up. And then uh, I went to uh, University of Winnipeg. Ended up at the University of Winnipeg, where I did my undergraduate degree in uh, history and geography. Mm -hmm. Understood. Why exactly history and geography? Well, oh, I've always loved history. You can't study history without studying geography. They're 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 one and the same. You know, other courses too. Of course, studied some economics courses, um, and and some sciences. You know, in the usual undergraduate thing. But um, no, I've always loved history. I've had fantastic history teachers all through my career uh, as a student. So I, it was it was obvious that, uh, and I like the academic rigor of history and that's what I really enjoyed about it interesting because as we often debate in class in Russia history is very rarely the most favorite subject primarily because of the way it is taught you know something about the way history is taught in Russia it's a lot of single perspective and a lot of dates whereas <laughs> in so to say the IB curriculum it is more of few dates for historiography and then a lot of perspectives. What was your approach of teaching history to students? It's History is a very challenging subject to teach just for exactly what you said, historiography. You need a, a level of knowledge before you can actually start debating it. And that's one of the most challenging things. Um, it's not just Russia that teaches history like that. A lot of countries teach history, memorization of dates and places and names. Canadian system was very similar, but I was very lucky to have uh, one history teacher who actually wanted to know the why, he wanted to know that we could think. So we actually engaged that we just, it just wasn't a memorization. But with students, that's one of the biggest challenges is, is learning the historiography. But it's not, it isn't any different than teaching economics. Because as you know, you're in my economics class, you need to learn the definitions, the, the, the theory, the diagram. I'm not going to stand up there for 80 minutes of class and lecture on it. I'll give you, what, 15, 20 minutes worth of lecture. And then you go off and learn that. Once you've learned that foundation of knowledge, then we can actually start having a discussion. Um, and that's where the learning really takes place. So uh, unfortunately for the student, whether you're studying history or economics, there's an incredible amount of information that the student has to absorb very, very quickly. If they have a, a knowledge or a love for the subject, then they'll enjoy it. But uh, Again, that's where the IB is very challenging, is just learning the material is not important as developing your, your thinking skills. But that's, I'd say that's the better approach to education as it 
prepare students better for the future life. If you just know the material, you're an encyclopedia. If you have critical thinking, you're not to say a machine, but you're a person, a professional that can apply skills, right? Well, life isn't black and white. It isn't. It's very gray. And, um, you know, you want to take any historical event, you and I can sit here for hours debating. You put five historians in a room, they're going to debate. Put five economists in a room, they're going to debate. And, and that's real learning. That's where learning takes place. Um, as long as you understand the foundation of people's knowledge and you're willing to be open to what other people think. Well, that's really the words of the TOK teacher because, <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of our viewers know what history is. A bit fewer students and teachers and parents and other people know what economics is. But re really, outside of the IB system, not many people know what TOK is. So for our fellow viewers, could you please tell that in a matter of five minutes, what TOK is about? You could actually study TOK in university and get a degree in theory of knowledge. It's, um, it's called epistemology. And it's a branch of philosophy, whereas philosophy, you can go around and around and around in, with subjects and never come to an end. Like, is there, is there a true altruistic act? Well, you, we can debate that forever. Theory of knowledge is critical thinking, but it requires you to come down on an answer. But you recognize other perspectives, you recognize your own bias. But that's really what it is, is the idea that you have to, you have to take a side. You have to... When it's all, all said and done and balanced in the end, you have to make a decision on which where you stand. And being a TOK teacher makes you much better teacher in history and economics and in every other subject, whether the sciences or maths, because that's what education is. It's questioning. Um, there's always been the mentality that math and science are so exact and so precise. Well. Math is based on a series of assumptions, just like economics is, and science, everything in science is the theory of this, the theory of that. So I really loved a, a good joke <laughs> I've seen on the internet, saying like, physics is a precise science, we're exact, and in reality, physicians are like, well, black holes have negative gravity, or they don't. <laughs> well, there are white holes, or there aren't, we're not sure, and like, well, yeah, you could travel faster than speed light, or you could, and we, we don't know. <laughs> it's uncertain. And that's absolutely true, because nothing we learn is certain. History is not certain. Mm -hmm. We get new information all the time, and we can debate and debate and debate. And, and so that's the one thing I love about the IB program, is it prepares you for that national debate when you get out of school. And you keep thinking, and you keep wondering. Um, so I, I saw a beautiful quote by John Dewey this morning. Ed, you know, school is not the end of your education, it's the start of life. Education is the start of your life. So well, very reasonable as almost all the kids find themselves in school as if, as in what they like to do, what they enjoy most, what, what they hate most, what is in their, <laughs> so to say, middle, the gray area, as you always love to say. Life truly is black to white, not black and white. Mm -hmm. the, the junction there is very important. Two is a great spectrum and being a physics student and also a <laughs> physics habit, you will say in physics there is a conception of infinitely small as if to ignore all the side effects, but infinitely small can still be infinitely big <laughs> because in an infinitely small object there is still a insane amount of particles and we call that an, in, an immeasurably big inside of an infinitely small. Mm -hmm. And that's the number of perspectives. There is a great book. It's called The Watch. It's a hexology. No, it's a septology of seven books. Russian fantastic writer. Well, I always forget the name, <laughs> but the, the series is called The Watch. Basically about how magic is integrated into our lives today. It gives a lot of explanation to many things as to if the magicians have created the Soviet Union as it was the greatest sociological experiment of all times. Uh -huh. And actually, the book is about that magic has learned to be in balance, and the, so to say, light forces and the forces of the dark. And so every light action has to be counterbalanced with the action of the dark and vice versa. So the greatest quote I took from that book and I ever cite is, there are at least two truths, which means the absolute truth doesn't exist. 
<laughs> who decides what's black and who decides what's white? It's all defining your terms like we do in TOK. You of must course. define your terms first. And that's where a lot of arguments can happen is if you don't believe somebody else's premise, then we'll have to have a discussion. And that's what debate is all about. Well, that's proper mm -hmm. debate. Mm -hmm. But a lot of schools have trouble teaching children to debate. So in your class, I believe you try to teach children the proper debate. Well, not I call them children, but some of your students are older than me. Well, no, one of them's here, I think. Oh, well, he, he might be. He's hiding <laughs> behind the camera. Ve not very few, but a lot of people have trouble leading a proper debate. They go to personal argument. What would you say is the better approach to teach students, or not even students, but any person, a proper debate? Practice in the class or some exercises for critical thinking? or There's formal ways of debating. Your first chair, your second chair, your third chair. I find those to be quite wooden. We use those in Model, Model United Nations. We use that in World Scholars Cup. They can be quite, uh, like I said, wooden and, and contrived. A lot of elementary teachers ask me this question, how do I get a debate starting in my classroom? When a student makes an assertion, I always say, so what? So how is that important? Or just asking questions. And that's the most important part of debate is, is constantly asking the questions and getting people to think and be willing to understand. A lot of people, they have a tendency to think of what's my next point? You're not actually listening to what the other person is saying. And so when you catch somebody not listening to what you're saying, you keep asking them the question. I said, that's not what I said. So you actually want to develop a true dialogue going on between people. But it's very simple to start a debate. It is just ask, so what? Or how do you know? It is a beautiful question to ask. Um, I was uh, standing in the hall. You know the way I dress at mm -hmm. school, like a 1950s Soviet agent. And uh, one of the students walked by. He was elementary. I didn't. He was a middle school. I don't know the boy. And he said, oh, nice hat. You look like Sherlock Holmes. And I said, Sherlock Holmes wears a deerstalker, not a fedora. But he didn't engage me in the discussion. It was just sort of like... So always ask, always stating things, always asking things, always, uh, you know, you, you got to keep at people. You got to keep at people. And it's fantastic because you meet students that love to debate. I remember Abdul Jalil, first time I met him, he turned to me in the line in the cafeteria and he said, um, we're all equal. And I go, no, we're not. <laughs> and he's like, what? And I said, we're not equal. I said, you and I are not equals. Uh, you and other Russian students are not equals. They, you know, you've got a privileged education. Other Russian kids don't have that opportunity. Um, I have a different background. So human beings aren't equal. It's about equity. It's about giving people what they need. Some people are, are much smarter than other people. Some people are better at languages than others. So we're not equal, but giving people what they need to be able to, uh, to rise as far as they wish to rise. And so, and I love that because every day I saw Abdul Jalil, we had these discussions and these arguments and he's a great student. He says hello to me and goodbye to me every day. So, and that's how you start a debate is you start finding people that are willing to engage and questioning them. And then not taking the heavy because of course being a teacher, you can be in a, you're in a position of authority and I, I love students that are smarter than me. I love students that challenge me because it's, that's what the job is about. <laughs> sure, the job is about not being the absolute authority because no. as soon as you become the, as soon as you take the hold of the position of the absolute authority, you turn into an encyclopedia. <laughs> and you don't want to be the walking encyclopedia. You want to be the walking thinker. Well, it's what Lord Bertrand Russell said. He said, I would never die for my beliefs. I might be wrong. We have to accept that we are not the fountain of knowledge. Of course. And simple knowledge, and we look at that in TOK, the simple knowledge. One plus one is two. That's simple knowledge. We can, when did the First World War start? Yes, we can, that's not debatable, but that's not, that's just basic knowledge. That's simple that's, knowledge. It's not the First order knowledge, so to say. First we, order knowledge. As we love to say in TOK. Absolutely, as opposed to second order knowledge. So um, if you want to keep yourself at the first order level, it's very boring. Mm -hmm. But uh, getting those those more global questions. And um, I know you're going to ask me about how much paper I use in class, and I'm looking forward to that one. Uh, oh, of course. I'm already prepared for that. 
Mr. Zemel the Forcier, the Oracle. <laughs> he knows the questions before I show them. No, you told him. me. And you told me you were going to bring it up. So that's the truth about foreseeing. <laughs> Foreseers and oracles are just good showmen. Absolutely. <laughs> good. So, but Mr. Zemel isn't only the great economics and history and TOK teacher. He's also one of the most experienced IB teachers in our school. What's your experience with IB? 17 years? been teaching internationally for 18 years. 15 years of it has been in MYP or, or DP schools. MYP or DP, which is IB. Yep. Oh, a bit of our favorite economics conundrums. Could you give me a brief compare and contrast with between IB and other education systems, as if A-levels or Canadian governmental system or Russian? I can talk about the Canadian system because I've taught within the Canadian Please? system. It's um, The Canadian system, so for example, for history, is very much uh, founded upon the idea of teaching the historiography, um, but not so much debating the points and the ideas um, with like we do in the uh, in the IB. The Canadian system is very strong. It depends on the province you're from. Ontario, where I, I taught, it's a very strong system, but it's very prescribed what you have to talk about. You have to teach this, and you must teach this, you must teach this. And it doesn't leave a lot of room for the critical thinking and the debates and, and, and that sort of thing. Whereas I find the IB, even though there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information in the DP you have to get through, that ultimately... Um, there's a lot more time for that, those debatable moments, because it's all founded in the entire program. Theory of knowledge is something that's not just taught in my class. It needs to be happening in every class. And I've been um, helping the other teachers develop their critical thinking. Most teachers do it in class. They just don't realize what they're doing is theory of knowledge. And I say, well, you're actually probably doing it in class anyway. But the idea is trying to integrate it down to MYP. And actually, that's made me an excellent MYP teacher, being a TOK teacher, because we can have so much fun. The younger a student is, the more malleable their brain is, and the more they question things. So I don't see why we're not uh, teaching more critical thinking down at lower grades. <coughs> Excuse me. Because it, the brains are there. They want to know these questions. Um, I've seen situations where um, students... Um, I was supply teaching for a class I was in... Thailand, and it was an INS class, and the students, um, so I was, just, I just asked them, so there was grade seven, I think, uh, what are you doing? And they said, oh, we're studying Mesopotamia, and I said, um, well, that's interesting, tell me about it, and you can see one of the students, I could tell what kind of a student she was with experience, that she's one of those students that asks all those big questions and gets shut down by her teacher, it does happen. Um, she would question why, 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 and uh, one of her responses to my question seemed quite kind of sarcastic, almost like she was about to be shut down by this teacher, and I said, well, how do we know that? We're talking about where the roofs are placed mm -hmm. in Mesopotamian houses, and they're in the roof, okay. you know, and um, I said, well, how do we know that? And then she was like, she was taken aback because someone actually took an interest mm -hmm. in in, in she was she she thought more than just memorizing what she was supposed to and we had a great conversation and it made her feel much better and I think that just comes with security for some teachers that um, or maybe the way you were brought up as a student that you didn't question the teacher you just did your work whereas me I, I, I think it's more important to know why we're doing it yes so one of the last questions in the school education blocks where, which countries did you work in before coming to Kazan, Russia? Oh, started in Egypt, moved uh, did three years in Egypt at a Canadian school, and moved on to Bangladesh. And that's where I, I got my, my, my start in the IB. Started as an MYP teacher my first year. I moved into DP history. So it was three years in Bangladesh. Then I moved on to Qatar, and um, those were both IB schools. Uh, the Leadership Academy for four years, and then the International School of London, Qatar. Um, and then moved on uh, to the Canadian school in Beijing. That wasn't Canadian curriculum, that was actually full IB. And then to Thailand, to Kazan. So, so well, you've been around? Or been around a bit, yeah. What was, uh, was there a particular reason of choice for a Kazan? 
Well, I think as most people know, I, I know Mr. Rosberg. Mr. Rosberg uh, and I worked together. He was my DP coordinator when I arrived in Qatar. That's how. Mm -hmm. So he was the DP coordinator. And he's the one that actually, he got promoted to deputy uh, or vice principal. And when they asked him, well, who's going to take over TOK? He goes, well, Bruce will. So he had a lot of confidence mm -hmm. that I could actually. So he's the one that gave me my start in, in TOK. And then eventually, as you do, he he moved on with his career and he went on, he went his way. But uh, so one, um, you know, every year we would share, exchange Christmas cards or that sort of thing. And out of the blue, he said, I've got a job if you want it. Mm -hmm. And we, Interesting. we'd already, st already talked, always talked about that, that, um, you know, if, if, you know, I obviously he likes what I do. And uh, so he was, I have a job if you'd like it. And that's why I came. And come on, it's uh, Russia. It's an exciting, exciting possibility. How many people can uh, say they lived in Russia? <laughs> so especially in light of all the, uh, the geopolitical, well, everything that's basically happened mm -hmm. in the last hundred years within this country. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's exciting. And well, is this your first time coming to Russia, or you've been here before? No, no, I've never, never been to Russia. When I was in the, I was in the Gulf, or in the Gulf, um, with the military during the first Gulf War, and we had leave, and we thought about um, it was a, it was actually well, the first Gulf War was 1990, 91, or was uh, 1991, and so the Cold War was coming to an end. The Soviet Union was crumbling, and so we thought it would be a, a great opportunity to. Uh, to go, and we thought about it, but then uh, we were warned against it being foreign soldiers. It's probably not the best place to go at the moment. Mm. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, well, a lot of a lot of. There's a lot of things going on in the in the Soviet Union, starting with the you know the crumbling of the Berlin Wall, and then eventually the. So it wasn't the best time. So we opted to go to Germany mm -hmm. instead for leave. So, <laughs> well, 1990, Germany, falling apart, Soviet Union. Yeah, that's a reasonable choice. Yeah, well, so we, we were kind of banned from traveling too, being being foreign, being NATO soldiers. We were also well. Let's not in <laughs> spoil that for the years just yet. <laughs> and so, how was it? First impression of Russia. Well, it took three months to get into the country, so that was reasonable. the uh, that was <laughs> because of bureaucracy and all sorts of other things and COVID restrictions and whatnot. So it was like there was no impression. It was uh, you know we. Uh, we couldn't, I couldn't teach my classes living in Canada, seven hour time difference. I'd have to get up in the middle of the night to teach. And I, it just, it was taking a toll though. I just suggested to school, why don't we move to Istanbul? And then I could, cause we're in the same time zone. So actually the six weeks we spent in time in Istanbul was fantastic. Oh. But um, by the time we got, uh, got the visas and got into the country and it was, got out of quarantine, it was like, get to work. So actually we didn't go anywhere at Christmas cause we just arrived here in November. So I never really got to see uh, Russia until uh, the summer. So mo most most teachers, when they come in, they come in in August and they have the fall break and Christmas and they travel and that. But it was just so hectic and stressful getting into the country that it was uh, didn't really get a chance to look around and see much until uh, we, we didn't travel. First time we traveled out of Kazan was actually last summer. And it was just situation. So where was it? travel oh we did two weeks we did a week in uh, we took the train to moscow we did a week in moscow and then did a week in st petersburg but it was such a hot summer as well so it, it was, was a uh, hot was summer indeed very hot so and then we came back and we spent the rest of the summer here of course because um canadians still have the travel restrictions they didn't lift the travel restrictions against the british or the american until halfway through the summer anyway so we couldn't go home we couldn't travel so it was a chance for us to to see the country as well but uh, again, it was just so incredibly hot <laughs> that uh, you really didn't want to do a lot of traveling. Well, couldn't enjoy things as much as you normally would when yes. the weather is nice. But are you planning any future travels across the beauties of the Russian nature, like Kamchatka, Sakhalin, Altai, Siberia, we, maybe? We love St. Petersburg. We've only really seen St. Petersburg, Moscow, and, uh, um, and of course, a lot of Kazan. <laughs> We've been here. The thing about Russia is it's got the same geography as Canada. It's the same. So to go out to Vladivostok, uh, to go out east, is no different than traveling within Canada. So, and um, we do, we, there, are, there is one place I want to get to, 
Archangel is a Commonwealth Cemetery from the Great War there. There's a Victoria Cross. He's not buried there. He actually, they found his grave just recently. He was, um, he was an Australian soldier who fought with the British. But during the uh, North Siberia Field Force fighting on, on behalf of the Whites against the Reds in the Revolution, um, and uh, he was killed taking a bunker um, north of Archangel. He received the Victoria Cross, but he was killed. Um, so his name is commemorated on a, uh, in a in a small cemetery that exists in Archangel, and I'd like to go and visit that cemetery. So these are all Commonwealth British Empire soldiers that died mm -hmm. fighting the Bolsheviks in uh, 1919. And the Canadians were part of that. I don't know if there's any Canadian graves up there, but maybe there are. But uh, for the spring break coming up, we're planning to go back to uh, Saint Petersburg. We just absolutely love. St. Petersburg. It has such a different vibe. The, uh, I always say Moscow is, is for, for young men and St. Petersburg is for the old men. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it, it has a different, it has a, a vibe. St. Petersburg reminds me of Montreal. Mo Moscow is more like Toronto. So I mm -hmm. prefer to go to Montreal than Toronto. <laughs> well, m Moscow is a city that you go to work to. There's no real life as in as in rest for the soul. If you were to summarize Moscow it, in one sentence, it would, be, it, pro it would probably be life for money, not money for life. The, uh, that's interesting. The, uh, I think if you're young, if you're, if you're a younger person and you're looking for bars and clubs and, and, all, that, uh, and all that, Moscow has all that. And of course, the history of Moscow it was phenomenal. I wish it wasn't so hot where we were there. But seeing things, I, I love, you know this, T.O.K., I love spy stories. You know, to, to stand where, where Gordievsky <laughs> gave his signal to the uh, MI6 agents that beside the Ukraine hotel, I love that. I love walking the ground of where things happen. Uh, Red Square, when the, uh, especially when the, uh, the German pilot, the young man, probably about your age, did you hear about this one at the end of the, just mm -hmm. at the end of the Cold War, he flew a small, a small Cessna biplane from, was it Sweden? Or from Germany up through Sweden. He managed to land in Red Square. Really? Yep. You actually have a look at it. Wait, it's was it a crash landing? Or no, he landed. He did it on purpose. He flew both below Soviet air defense radar and proved that he could do it. He landed on Red Square. This was 1988 or 89. It's a fantastic story. But I love being places where, where history has taken place. And come on, you know, so much, uh, this, the, this country, whether whatever you want to call it, has been a huge part of, of history for hundreds of years. Oh, indeed. So it's, it's fascinating. And of course, loving history, getting to see all these places that you've only read about in books or seen in movies. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, I can totally relate to that. Uh, I love <laughs> a lot of history-based novels, so to say, the ones that touch upon the history a lot, sometimes with controversial perspectives, but nevertheless, when you've read through the books, book like twice throughout <laughs> three years, and you have a clear imagination of what the place looks like, and you come there and it's either absolutely the same, but the energy multiplied by 100 or totally different, it's a great source of emotion. It is. It gives you a whole different perspective on things. I'm, I, I like macabre travels too. I go to cemeteries, of course. Um, I've been to several of the, the German concentration camps. It's, it's a morbid fascination, really, what it is, or just walking the ground in Germany, you know, staying in the places where Hitler stood. And just, just, it really brings it, like you said, it brings it alive once you've walked the ground and you've seen, and it puts it into, really puts the history into perspective. So. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was Mr. Zemo, the teacher and mm. the historian. Mm -hmm. But a lot of interesting stories and I believe occasions has happened to Mr. Zemo in between his birth in Canada <laughs> and him sitting here right now. And that is Mr. Zemo, the member of the Canadian Army. Mr. Zemo, how did you, a person who studied history and history and teaching in university, end up in the Army? Well, it's actually quite funny because um, I was always part of youth groups growing up. In Canada, mm -hmm. we have these fantastic youth groups. Um, the, uh, the most famous one would be the, the scouting organization started by Lord Baden-Powell. So like the Boy Scouts? Yep. 
it's uh, Americans call it Boy Scouts. We call it scouting. And it was started by Lord Baden Powell um, you know, in England. Um, but before that, you have uh, for the youngest kids, you have what's called the beavers. Of course, being Canadian, they call you a beaver. And you got your little hat, and you got a little tail sticking out of it. And it's it's um, it's these fantastic youth groups where you go off and you do amazing things, and you have a lot of fun. And then you get into um, what they call uh, cubs. They call cubs. We didn't call them cubs. Cubs. They're called cubs. And then when you're old enough, you go into the scouting movement. And so these are these these great organizations. And then one day. Uh, a guy I was in scouting with, he said, you know, I just found out about this new organization. It's called Cadets. And cadets. it's based on military. Now they have Army, Navy, and Air Force Cadets. And of course, being a young man, I was like, oh, the Air Force, you know, no, 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 Navy, no, nah, 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 Army. We're going to go to the Army Cadets. We went and checked it out. And it's a youth organization that uh, teaches basically citizenship and leadership on, on military principles. So that's where I got my first taste of, of military leadership, of military experience. I did some amazing things. Seven years in, um, in the Royal Canadian Army Cadets, um, I left as a, a, a warrant officer first class. So the highest non-commissioned rank you could possibly get. Summer camps everywhere, climbing mountains. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of outward bound. It's a little bit of military service. They teach you how to be a leader. I got to go on a, on a European uh, exchange to, uh, we had, the Canadian forces were in Germany during the Cold War. They used to do a, a flyover every summer. So we went over and trained with the Canadian Army in Germany as real soldiers. So it was it was just good fun. It was like everybody pulling in the, in the same direction. And actually, that's where I got my parachute training was actually in cadets. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was always determined to go to university um, after high school. So I, I never really thought about going to the Royal Military College. It really wasn't for me that sort of a thing. So I wanted to go to the civilian university and get an education because I didn't know I was going to make the military my career anyway. So I, um, I joined the reserves or the militia. We call it the militia in Canada, the reserves, the army reserves. And uh, as a ranker, I was just, just as a private and had just continued. It was a good way to pay your way through, uh, through university, working part-time for the military. And it was good fun. And uh, eventually, after about four years, I was, uh, you know, I was, I was a young NCO, and then they they tipped me for commission. They asked me if I wanted to be an officer, and so I went through the boards and through the training. And I became a, a young officer. When I graduated from university, I, I was like, I think I want to do this for a little while. Yeah, I, I kind of got the bug for the the travel and the excitement and the adventure. You know, I might not look at at fifty one right now, but I was actually quite. Uh, quite the adventurer when I was young. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I went in and I took a regular commission for, for nine years. And I went into the regular army as an officer. And I absolutely, I really enjoyed it. it. It's really neat. And it's funny how you say, you know, you, with, with a history degree and all this education, I, I worked with some of the most intelligent people I've ever worked really? with in my life in the military. I'm talking some of the, uh, most of the officers I worked with were better read than I was. They were smarter than I was. And I was like, I was quite surprised. The uh, people get a, uh, the wrong impression about the military, especially a, a professional volunteer military, is um, a lot of my fellow officers, I learned a lot from them, and they're very, very intelligent. I miss a lot of them. When you're, when you're working for an organization where everyone's pulling in the same direction, and uh, so it's kind of like um, what I think sometimes students feel when they, they'll say something, and then I'll say something to counter that, and they're like, oh, Okay, I felt that way too when I was younger because I was learning. So I really did enjoy my, uh, my time in the military. But it wasn't, uh, it's not what you see in the movies. It's actually, um, they prepared me to be a teacher. Uh, you're learning servant leadership. That's the best leadership out there. It's not positional, just because I was in charge. It didn't mean I was, uh, you know, I was responsible, but you can't just order people around. You know, if you, um, especially in a professional volunteer military, you want the soldiers to follow you, they have to trust you. And so it actually prepared me to be a teacher quite well. But I'm, I'm actually quite proud of the time I spent in the military. I did some pretty, pretty amazing things. I got to see some amazing places. Uh, got to see some not so amazing things. Um, but you don't remember that. You only remember the good. You never remember the bad. Well, <laughs> it's interesting how it comes out to that any officer is sort of a bit prepared to be a teacher and vice versa. Is it? Well, 
it's sort of caring about your <laughs> students in school and then caring about your soldiers in the army. Well, my idea of why people often get the wrong impression about the army is there is a difference between a common soldier and an officer. An officer, well, looking back to the history of, say, Russian Empire, officers were noble people and the the nobility class, the uh, nobility I'm talking, the highest below this, the Tsar family, for example, Men Menshikov, the best friend of Peter the Great, or the Yusupov family or the others, they all were like colonels and often generals. Mm -hmm. Because it's not necessarily for, it's not necessarily to go to war to be in the army. Is it? No, actually, you're... Uh, Yes and no. Yes and no. Um, it's kind of like, imagine training your whole life as a teacher, but never actually allow, being allowed to stand in front of a class and actually do your craft. Um, there's, there's, there's a part of you as a soldier, um, you want to go. You know, war is horrific and it's destructive, but it's also, this is what you're training to do. And so you want to see, am I good enough? Will I be good enough to do it? Of course, looking at uh, Imperial Russia, it's the same as the British Empire. Their officers came from a very narrow social class as well. But, um, but that was over 100 years ago. But if you look at the colonies, Canada, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, we're a little more rebellious. We always were. Um, and the British knew that. So the British Army in, say, the Victorian period, you know, fighting in the Boer War or even in the Great War, the men came from that lower social class. And, and so they were forced to live within that, that class system. Now, you could move up. In the Great War, uh, it was such a destructive war. Officers were getting killed left, right, and center. And so meritocracy began. So that's one of the greatest things that came out of the Great War is, is the um, a, a leveling of society, that you get a, a young man who's a private, and he could, actually leave, he could actually leave the military as a colonel um, because in a war like that, it, 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 it's about put the best people rise to the top when you have a long, prolonged war like that. So, but this is the evolution of, of military thinking. But Canadians and Australians and New Zealanders have always been a bit, a bit rebellious. We've always been a little, um, because we don't have that social system. In Canada, we, we never had that, that social hierarchy of, um, you know, lords and aristocrats. So we, we, we've always been a more egalitarian society. And we probably get that influence from being so close to the Americans, that the idea is uh, you've got to be good. Even in the Great War, you know, you've got to be good. Uh, if you're going to be an officer leading these soldiers, you better be good because if you're not, they're not going to sacrifice their lives for you. They'll, they'll throw a grenade into your dugout, <laughs> honestly. And it did happen during the Great War. So fortunately in the, uh, in the British Empire, those of us that come from the colonies, we already had kind of a meritocracy. And as long as you're under command of Canadians, or Australians or New Zealanders, then you're fine whenever we were put under British command. The British never understood us. Um, there, was a good, uh, there was a good case of Douglas Batter, the, uh, the British fighter pilot from World War II who lost both leg, legs in a, in a flying accident in the 1930s, but because of the Second World War, they couldn't turn everyone down. Actually, he was a really good fighter pilot because he could handle more Gs because the blood didn't have to flow as far down in his body. So he was a really good fighter pilot. Oh, really? Yes. So without the legs, he actually became a better pilot. He, be, he could actually... Oh, he that's could, an interesting story. He could torque his Spitfire over in, in G-forces that other pilots would have blacked out. After the retreat from um, Dunkirk in 1940, there was a Canadian squadron, 242 squadron. It was very demoralized. Um, and uh, he was basically went there to shape the, to whip him into shape. But he also realized, and I remember watching a documentary about his wife saying that the Canadians never were ones for discipline. Um, so it's like it takes a lot more than a position and a title um, for those of us that come from the colonies to just accept your authority. You've got to you've got to prove yourself. Uh, just because you're in charge doesn't mean I'm going to. I will respect your rank, but you need to, to show me that you actually care about me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so fortunately, coming from the British colonies, 
we're a little bit more rebellious than uh, so. Uh, and unfortunately, of course, when you have those aristocratic systems like in Imperial Russia or in Germany or, or the British Empire that the, the soldiers came from these, these lower social classes. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate because some of them were incredibly brave and incredibly smart. It's just you see it with students today. We have students in our school that um, are on scholarship, and they have, they have ability, but they don't have the means. Whereas we have students in our school that have the means, but not necessarily having the, the ability. So Let's just, not call the names today. I didn't call anybody any names at all. I'm, what I'm saying is that life is about opportunities. Of course. And, and some people have better opportunities than others. Well, coming back to the concept of equality and equity, I would say a lot of people have seen the pictures, pictures uh, about difference between equality and equity. The three children mm -hmm. standing behind the fence and looking at football. Equality, everyone's uh, got a crate to stand on, so <coughs> the tallest one can see good. The middle-sized one can just barely look over the fence, and it's the show is not good for him. And the small child is, he cannot see anything. Yeah. Whereas in equity, the small child gets two crates. He can see very well. No, he gets three crates, so he yeah. can see very well. Then the the middle-sized child gets two, and he also can see, and the big one stands on the ground because he can see very he good. Need but the comment I've seen below that picture is hilarious. He said, the, the guy or the lady, I don't remember, said, well, actually, look, the small one is too weak. He cannot carry the crate. The middle-sized one is also too small. He can only push it. So all work of stacking the crates on top of each other was the work of the big of the big guy but then at the end the result is the same so where's the equity in that <laughs> and then the comment was of course in america they would have made the fence like uh, 10 meters tall pay for your tickets ah, now you're name calling the americans Actually, oh yes i am name calling as the a, americans as a canadian we uh, we tend to defend the americans when we're at home of course we make fun of them because you make fun of your neighbors but when we're overseas um the um some of the greatest social movements have come out of the United States. As also, it, it's a great place for innovation, but it's also a very hard country that if you, um, you know, you, you can fall by the wayside. But at the same time, you can make a mistake and start all over again in the United States. So it's not stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> well, my approach to stereotyping is, so to say, make fun of everyone. That's equal. Oh, that's reverency. Yeah, that's just making fun of everything. I'm quite irreverent. I oh, of course. see the humor in everything. Yeah. See, seeing the humor in everything is a great talent because, well, you know I quote to you my favorite comic, Mikhail Zadornov, almost every day, yep. whenever I have a chance. <laughs> well, because he's great, he's hilarious, and I don't, he's one of the few people that in Russia nobody hates. It's like you cannot be a politician and not have the opposition who hates you. But when <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't. I, I've thought about this. You, you cannot. You have to be basically a sentient be sentinel being outside of this world, and even then someone will hate you. Like, uh, but with him, he's got a lot of great wisdom wrapped in humor, and one of the greatest saying of his, there are three ways of acknowledging God in this world, nature, love, and sense of humor. Nature lets us exist. Love lets us live. History, uh, humor lets us go, get over things. Whenever there is a problem, I tend to find hilarious things about it, and it gets easier. I think you're right. I think um, we're we're too. Everyone is. There's a perception that everyone is so serious, and everyone must be serious about everything all the time. Um, there's a line from the movie League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Oh, love that movie. When he says. Um, the empire is in peril, and he goes. You're probably too long to, young to realize, but the empire is in some, always in some sort of peril. Um, it's it, it, uh, it's actually the the comedians nowadays that are leading the charge against this political correctness and this mm -hmm. this left wing woke movements, saying because everyone gets offended so easy, and it, it, it's that's what's worrisome. Is, is, is you make a joke and it's not a, jokes are designed to, to make you laugh, but they can be, you know, you don't want to take, um, you know, you don't make fun of somebody at their, 
their expense. But um, we need to laugh more. I think people, it's like, you know, I was I was always told, don't take life too seriously. You're not getting it out of, getting out of it alive anyway. Indeed. So, but so why we, not have a bit of fun? Just as long as you're not doing it at the expense of other people. Um, and just see the humor. You have to. I think you'd go completely mad if you don't. Well, if you don't laugh, you're going to, if you don't laugh, you're going to forget how to laugh. And then your lips are instinct instinctively <laughs> going to go down into a grumpy face. Exactly. Talking about the British stubbornness, I remember, not stubbornness, but principality and love for ranks you've talked about in the military. I remember one great British anecdote actually told by the British. So there is a flood in London. And so the butler runs to the master, says, Master, 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 th there is a flood. We have to evacuate. The master, the Lord says, come out and come in as you should. The butler comes out, knocks mm. on the door. Yes, come in. Sir, the Thames is at the door. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, I, do, uh, I do like the aristocratic system, though, when it's properly a... Everything is popular in b until it becomes no longer popular. Empire was popular until the Great War. Um, and people, I like the aristocratic system. I like this, the idea of the noblesse oblige. You know, you're, you're a, a duke and you, you run a dukedom. And, and they would take their responsibilities very seriously. You're a lord of the land. Um, and you, you're, you're, it's almost a paternalism. John Stuart Mill talks about paternalism. And this idea that, you know, the system wasn't all bad. It's like as long as people took responsibility for their land and the people on their land and make sure that they had everything they need, which, um, you know, other people's lives right now might be better under that sort of a system. So this is what education is about, is about sitting down and debating and not just accepting this is good and that is bad and all of a sudden this is no longer popular, so now this is... And it's like, no, let's, let's actually have a debate. Let's actually talk and have a discourse and talk about these things. Of course. Well, it's illogical to assume that one person or a group of people acting as a single regulatory organization can rule the government and be absolutely correct because, as I've already said, <laughs> there are at least two truths, which well, means the absolute truth doesn't exist. That's one of our big arguments in history. Is history made by individuals or by groups of people? You can go around and around and around discussing that, and there is there is no right answer. But is, are, is history made by a group or is it made by individuals? So, and we have to have this discussion. Um, but I think individualism is very important. Um, after the Second World War, the the Germans actually said to the British when they they admired the British Special Forces, the Special Air Service, the Long Range Desert Group, the Commandos, the SOE, and the Germans said we could never emulate what you did because there's a fundamental flaw in our character that we don't think individualistically whereas um, some some of the greatest things that were ever done were, were done by eccentrics and and um, and and individualistic people and I, I'm an individual I like I'm pride myself on my individualism I'm not always right I'm not always wrong but um, I don't want to just follow the herd I don't want to just follow the masses. I like to think about it, and I've been wrong sometimes, and that's just, you know, and, and sometimes I've been right. So it's, uh, and I, I think we don't want to get lost in the crowd. Well, of course you don't want to be lost in the crowd. Though it's funny how a lot of people want to be outside of the crowd with a unique mentality, but also have universal acceptance. It's like, mm, can't have both. Controversial, cannot sit on two chairs. No, you cannot. It's, uh, it's just <laughs> like the video I showed you on the defender of the usual and obedient. If a person says, oh, I'd never do what an ordinary people person would do because his beliefs are based on the society. It's like, well, then your beliefs are also based on the society, but the other way around. Exactly. And you also, but you're also assuming that you know somebody else. And that's the foundation of theory of knowledge, is how do you know that? You know, people like to stereotype, they like to shoebox mm -hmm. you, pigeonhole you, throw you in, say, this is this is who he, who he is, this is who she is. I think we're a lot more complicated. Um, and people don't take the time to really get to know you. So, no. Yeah. Mm. I think somewhere in the video we'll add the count of 
how many times Mr. Zemel has quoted a person today? Probably here. <laughs> and then the number of times I made a joke about a foreign nation up here. <laughs> oh, these jokes are fun, though. Of course they are fun. Absolutely. I mean, as you've said, we're not getting live out of this, so why not make fun? The yeah, as long as it's as long as it's harmless, just harmless fun, and doesn't uh, you know, people have to have to lighten up. Um, and uh, sometimes I have to ask myself, am I getting, am I getting offended, or am I just think I'm getting offended? You know, mm -hmm. you have to learn to laugh at yourself. God. Yeah. Well, laughing at yourself is the biggest talent. If you cannot laugh at yourself, then, mm. it there's very few room for being self-critical if you cannot laugh at things. And self-deprecating. Self-deprecating. So. Exactly. So this has been Mr. Zemel, the teacher, and Mr. Zemel, the thinker about the military and politics. <laughs> now we get to a bit more private side of Mr. Zemel, because being a Canadian, Mr. Zemel is married to a Ukrainian woman. And the question that we had is, have you adopted any Ukrainian, Slavic, or perhaps even Russian traditions or habits by being married to a <laughs> Slavic woman? I think that's the only reason that her family accepted me. Uh, I grew up in Winnipeg, which I always joke is Kiev West. I remember the first time I brought Arena to uh, Winnipeg, and she could not believe all the Ukrainian and Slavic. We have a, this is where they all settled. The, uh, the interesting thing what Canada did at the late Victorian period was they looked at all these um, farmers living in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the farmers living in the Russian Empire, and they said, look, and of course, they couldn't own the land. The land was owned by the landlords, and Canada wanted to open up the West for farming, and this was 1890s, and they said, if you get here, we're going to give you a piece of land, and oh. it's yours, you own it. And so the Ukrainians and the Polish, and uh, we had a lot of Dukabors, which come from Russia, from what I understand. We don't have a lot of Russians in Canada, but we had a lot of people that came from the Russian Empire. Um, Ukrainians, of course, half of Ukraine was part of the Russian Empire. Where my wife is from is actually the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So growing up in, in Western Canada, um, we ate vareniki, we ate pierogies, we, we love halibchi. We, we have the, uh, every, every year when I was a cadet, I used to volunteer at the, to go to the Polish Legion to be on the color party because I loved the food afterwards. <laughs> so growing up, especially in Western Canada, was this all seemed normal to me. Um, and then, of course, when I brought her to Winnipeg for the first time to meet my family, and we were driving around, she couldn't believe how many Ukrainian Orthodox churches there were, how many uh, Ukrainian Catholic churches there they were, all the restaurants. She just could not believe um, how many Ukrainians. Uh, and actually, the province of Manitoba still has the highest percentage of uh, Ukrainian culture in, in Canada, um, although the largest Easter egg is actually in Vegreville, Alberta. But um, so for me, it was uh, I adopted these things before I even I even knew because I've well that that I call preparation. <laughs> but it was like Canada's not. Um, it's like what is what is it to be a Canadian? We've been wrestling with this for our whole life. And the great thing about being a Canadian is that you can be whatever it is you want, and you can celebrate. You know, I like this. I like this about this culture. About this culture. I like about this, and you can just. Um, mix and match really is what it is. Well, my, my heritage is, is German and Scottish. <clears throat> my, you know, my mother was very Scottish. And I grew up in... Um, my grandfather used to make this salad that the Ukrainians make. And, and it, it, so the cultures just melded. So I, I don't... I've always considered myself a European because I'm not I, a Canadian. Uh, well, and a Canadian, but what is a Canadian? You know what well, I mean? Th that's a debate. Mm. Well, actually, he can drive the debate even further. Is there even a country which is solemnly single cultural? I'd say no, because... Well, Finland, a place like well, that. Well, Finland, Finland, North Korea, but North Korea we don't know much about. But you look at a lot of uh, European countries. There, you know, there's a lot of immigrants and that, but there's still quite, Germany is still quite German. The Netherlands is quite ne uh, quite Dutch. Belgium. Um, whereas you get a country like Russia, what brings all the Russians together is the language. The language but how indeed. many different cultures 
across this this country you know it's like just in this, this area we have people that are just just a little bit different um, Russia and Canada are very similar that way and uh, so and that's what I love we're um, we're a polyglot society so we don't you know you have the Canadian stereotypes the, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police maple syrup and hockey those are just superficial but but Canada is is the whole world and and Russia the cultures are very different as well um, so and this is what I love about this is we're not pigeonholed to being just one thing so yeah I um, I feel right at home actually Eastern Europe is is my favorite part of the world uh, it's uh, it's Europe but it's Europe with a bit of an edge to it and it is it feels like home to me yeah. whether I'm I'm in Russia or I'm in Ukraine or we go to Romania or we go to Hungary um, Poland I just love the eastern part of the uh, it's, um, it's it's kind of a mythical it's where all the the fairy tales come from and the uh, the stories and Though so if you read the original German fairy tales that the brother Grimm fairy tales and other have break from God those are bloody dreams. oh I know they're quite a lot of it is quite macabre um, but uh, so for me I you know I never never picked up the language Ukraine I understand when my wife is upset with me but when why not it's a hard language Slavic languages to go from English like I'm not um, like uh, you know I understand French and I understand German and if I lived in Germany I'd be fluent within a year and if I lived in a French speaking place where I had to rely on French I'd be fluent as well but if um, but for me I just can't get the sound. Sometimes Russian sounds a bit French to me, the way it's spoken. It? Just like Turkish sounds a little bit German at times for me. But it's like I don't have an ear for languages. Um, again, French and, and German, I can... German is very much based on... English is very much based on German, but it's also based on French. And growing up in Canada, so I understand what people are saying. I can get by when I'm in France or in, in a German-speaking uh, country. But the Slavic... Whether it's Ukrainian or Russian, I just can't. Uh, I, I, I understand some of the words and 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 whatnot. But uh, one thing I found is it's kind of nice not to, to be in a group of people but not speak the language. I kind of really? enjoy that. It um, whenever I'd go visit family in Ukraine, you know they would. Uh, it's really funny because they'd always buy um, what well, they call it Vereniki, Pilmeni here. The ones with the meat, well, the meat dumplings, right? Well, it, it's <laughs> interesting. The the varenki and pelmeni, they aren't the same. They're no, they're not. Well, the concept is similar. It's meat wrapped in duff, but with varenki, you can have a different. You can have them with cheese, or sometimes even, well, not and with potatoes, jam, and with cheese. potatoes, and with cheese jam, and, and with cabbage and meat. Absolutely, but I prefer. Cheese and potatoes. Cheese and potatoes. But when I'm in Ukraine, they think, oh, he's a guest. We need to get uh, meat. the meat ones the meat. or the jam ones. I, I don't like those. I um, Simple taste. I like, and of course, I love smetana. You put smetana on a shoe and I'll eat it. <laughs> I don't care. You know, I love sour cream. Um, but uh, it, it's, I just grew up with this, with this culture. But it's neat when I'm there. And then they'll, We'll, we'll talk and people will translate a little bit, but it gets tiresome doing that. So it's fun to just kind of sit there. And uh, I'm used to being by myself, spending time on myself. I enjoy, I'm, I'm an introvert that way. I, I recharge by myself. And it's neat because you can sit and watch and you can see. I don't need to be a part of the conversation. I like to sit and watch people. And I like to, uh, and you could almost pick up the gist of the conversation and you could actually see, uh, you could actually interject. So that's a lot of fun for me, um, being not part of the conversation, but just watching the conversation unfold. I really, I've always considered myself what was called one of the backroom boys. I don't want to be out in front. I want to be in the, the guy in the back pulling the strings. <laughs> so that's why you lecture from the back of the class, not the forward of the class. Well, what is the, what is the back of the class <laughs> in my, my room? I've got uh, two whiteboards on, on the front and the back. So which is the front and which is the back? And the projectors on the side. So I don't think that room has a front or a back. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Zemel has purposefully picked a room so that no one can accuse him of lecturing from the front of the back to not insult the backs or the fronts of the classroom. Well, actually, uh, Vladislav over here, he, uh, we were debating how we were going to set up the classroom in the rows, and, of course, it was, it was fantastic because you can just turn around 
in your chair, and there's another there's another desk right in front of you, except for the people that are at the, at the end. But he, uh, Vladislav, who's doing the camera work today, he pointed that out. So we were talking about what's the best way to, to set up this classroom. Because I like to move around the classroom when I teach. That's why I have five whiteboards on three different walls. <laughs> <laughs> and the other teachers accuse you of stealing the whiteboards and accumulating them in your classroom. Nobody wanted this room. It was really funny. I was, uh, I was looking around for classrooms, and uh, nobody ever wanted this room. And I was like, I thought it was, I think it's a fantastic room. I think it's, a, it's, the, best, it's the best room. Um, people can hover around outside. You don't know they're there. They're listening. But when you walk in, you're committed. Whereas the other classrooms which have the glass walls, the open concept, you can, you can stand out there and you can watch and you can see. But my room, you got to come in. You got to commit yourself. You got to come in. So <laughs> it um, takes a lot of commitment to come to Mr. Zemo. I like that It's room. me every day I, before coming to your class. I'm like <laughs> preparing for a, for another half an hour talk. Well, that's you though. You're, well, that's me. That's you when your you should be when you should be working. You want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I when I should be talking, I want to work. That's true. Uh, a lot of students like he's talking to Mr. Zemo again. We got free time. <laughs> I'll come out and check on them. But that's yeah. the thing is that's what education is. It's it's an anchoring activity. Sometimes our economic anchoring activities might go a little bit longer than they mm -hmm. they need to. But there's a lot of things. And then it's go off and do your work. Um, teaching is not staying in front of a classroom lecturing. That's not teaching. That's boring. It so is. it's like the students, and sometimes students like it because they they can just switch their brains off and just. But no, you've got to go and do the work. You have yeah, to learn it. And that, that goes back to that idea of equity, is that some students, they need, um, they need different, uh, different these things, things to be taught differently to them for them to understand. So. Very interesting. <laughs> but I would say our viewers are already tired of school topics, so let's move Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, come on. School lets up at 3 a.m. At 3 a.m.? <laughs> yes, 3 a.m. Yeah. 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 Whoa! It's, to me as a Russian, because I would say R Russian is not a nationality, Russian is a mentality. If you speak- Or a language. If you speak Slavic language, you could consider yourself a Russian. It's a bit crazy to me to systematize, systemize the coming of morning and evening. So if it's 11.59, it's morning. If it's 12, it's day. Like who determined that? When you wake up, it's the morning. <laughs> when you go to sleep, it's the night. It's like you wake up at 2 p.m. It's like, you want some soup? Good morning. Yeah. Well, that's, that's how we your do body it here. Yeah, I could never eat soup for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. Again, breakfast is when you wake up. Breakfast is not something that's done at 7 a.m. It's when you wake up. Or it's when you break the fast and you're a Muslim, because that's really where the word came from. Well, break fast. Break fast. So there you go. Break fast. Not just Muslims, Christians fast yeah, as well. Not just Muslims. They're just the first that came to mind. Mm. Well, we know that you love to read because I believe the intel an intelligent person must read to claim his title. What are the other hobbies that you kill your not so numerous free time? I think it's funny that you assume that someone who reads is intelligent. I think back to the movie Fish Called Wanda, and there was Otto. He was a former assassin. It's Kevin Clint's comedy. Kevin Klein's character, he was, a, he was a former assassin for the CIA, and he thinks he's intellectual. He reads Nietzsche, but he reads the Coles notes of Nietzsche. You know, the, <laughs> he doesn't actually, in fact, read the books, and he thinks he's an intellectual. And, and so um, Wanda, who's Jamie Lee Cur Curtis, plays Wanda, and she says, you think you're an intellectual ape? And he goes, apes don't read philosophy. He goes, yes, they do, Otto. They just don't understand what they're reading. <laughs> and uh, I love that. I love that part. So well, I would phrase it differently. It's not that anyone who reads is intelligent. <laughs> I would say anyone who is intelligent reads. There you go. I like that. No, I, uh, I love to read. I've, I've set myself a goal of reading 10,000 pages for a pleasure year. a year. A year. 10,000 pages for pleasure. That's a good goal. Starting from my birthday to my birthday. The best I've done was 13,000 pages. But that was the first year of, uh, that was COVID. We had oh, a lot of time COVID. on our a hands. Lot of time. Um, but, uh, and, and most of, most of what I read is, uh, is nonfiction. My life is, is, or actually, no, I'm sorry. It's fiction. Life is nonfiction. My life is too real as it is. And, you know, when you're talking about history and you're talking about economics and all these other subjects, last thing I want to do is pick up a book that's going to talk about 
the, the, the history of economics or those sort of things. Because um, your brain is tired. It's nice to read fiction and completely get yourself away from uh, uh, where you're at at the but moment. But it's interesting because a lot of younger teachers, they prefer to read nonfiction about psychology, history, politics. Do you have any idea why that is the case? When I was young, I read a lot more, uh, a lot more uh, non-fiction. nonfiction. Absolutely, I think as you get older, um, you might you might turn to fiction. Could be considered as escapism, I suppose. But it, I guess it depends on what kind of fiction you you like to read. But I think as you get older, you've had enough of the nonfiction world that it's it's nice to go go into a, a world that existed at some time or never existed. A lot of people love fantasy. I'm, I don't read a lot of fantasy. A lot of people love fantasy. They, they you know, Lord of the Rings and um, Harry Potter. Look at, those are very, very popular because they're, they're, they're taking you out of the reality of what the world is like. And, and, um, and it, it, it's escapism. And I think we all need to intellectually escape every now and again. Well, uh, the world is the toughest thing that it is because the only thing out of which you cannot get alive is life. That's this joke said three times. Yeah. And I need two more and then we closed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, a lot of fiction, though. I prefer fiction. Fiction. Yeah, fiction. 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 fiction that makes you think. The last one I've read was the, the Hexology by Frank Herbert, The Dune. I really oh, yes, want, you're talking really, about The yeah, Dune. Yeah, I really want someone to get reading into it because it's a lot of discussion. Actually, I wanted to bring it up when we were talking about the military. The last book, the period between the third and the fourth book, and based on that, the, the main character, he goes into a symbiosis with a sandworm to, becomes the em to become an immortal emperor, and he reigns the empire for... 3,500 years because he has the gift of foreseeing and being the oracle he's seen the so-called golden way for the development of humanity the only way that humanity can escape the devastating inter the war between itself that will destroy the universe so what he did is he invented the so-called peace of letho the absolute peace basically turning every place of living in the universe in a village with a calm life to, as he said, seed the desire for love and adventure because that's what moved the world, right? Yes. Adventurism, desire to make something new, to rebel. And also, he had only female army. So males were not allowed to go in the army, only females. Interesting. Uh, and how he based that is actually war is created by male armies because masculinity and toxic masculinity that's accumulated in the armies creates the desire for war whereas women are naturally more inclined to <laughs> preserve the peace because they're inclined mothers whereas but your argument is also valuable that being in the army brings up it makes you more nurturing makes you more nurturing indeed it does. you start caring for the people well, i know i know where you're going with this because we've actually had this discussion the book i'm uh -huh. reading right now is called the regeneration trilogy and I'm reading the first book. I've seen the film many times. It's one of my favorite films. Um, it's basically about, it's a fictionalized account of Siegfried Sassoon, who was a, a poet. He came from the aristocrat, aristocratic uh, system. He was sent to Craig Lockhart Hospital in, uh, in Edinburgh. They said he was suffering from a mental breakdown, but actually what he did was he actually did a protest against the war. And his protests were read out in the, in the House of Commons. And he wasn't a pacifist. He was a very brave officer. He received the military cross twice. But he was, he was basically saying that the war is being deliberately um, continued for, for ends that were evil. And so instead of court-martialing him, they sent him to a hospital. And they put him under the care of Dr. William Rivers. And these are all people that existed. You can look it up. And the most interesting part of that is... Siegfried Sassoon, who was already an accomplished poet, he met Wilfred Owen. Oh, Wilfred Owen. I, I, the we war poet. We've covered him, yeah. And An the thing, person. he wasn't a, a very good poet, Wilfred Owen, at first. It was, um, he was just starting out. And Sassoon inspired 
inspired his, his, Bordeaux and his, his poetry. poetry. So it was wow. him and Robert Graves as well. He was another famous war poet. Uh, Sassoon and Graves were, were very good friends. So this first book is basically talking about an officer's hospital for um, in in Scotland of officers that are suffering from shell shock. But Sassoon was not suffering from shell shock. Basically, Rivers' mission was to make him change his mind and want to go back and fight in the war. Mm -hmm. So and I was reading that, and uh, students like to like to say that I'm a great teacher I'm a good teacher it's whatever that means um, and it's funny and it's like um, don't know it's always true I think some students actually don't like me they probably don't like my methods so but reading this book it made me realize my time in the military as, as an NCO and an officer made me nurturing it trained me to be a teacher so actually in fact that war seems like a masculine male dominated um, um, activity but actually in fact leaders in the military are quite nurturing because you're you're making sure that your soldiers their feet are taken care of and that they have their cup of tea and that they're taken care of soldiers always eat before the officers in a professional army and so you it goes back to being a servant leader and it made me realize going from the military into teaching that I brought that nurturing with me in the classroom and I think maybe students can sense sense that but also I have two sons of my own, so that's also nurturing as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's proof that uh, as a male, you don't have to walk around being all macho and show off and, and all this other stuff. You can actually be, you can be quite nurturing as, as a male. And actually, male nurturing and female nurturing are two different things. And the First World War made men more nurturing, and it actually made women more Masculine. Masculine because they went to work and they, they women got more confidence. They had money and they could, uh, you know, they could, uh, they could make decisions for what they wanted. So uh, war, yes, uh, can be a horrific thing, but it can be a, a massive instrument for social change. Um, so the First World War was one of those things, you know. Millions of people died in it, but the social change that came social from it is indeed. amazing. Well, I've got one Russian example to proper officer behavior on my mind. Have you heard of Suvorov? No. Uh, the great Russian marshal, the commander of the whole army under Catherine the Great and her son, uh, Catherine the Second the Great and her son Paul the First. Well, a story I've read long ago. So one general, he didn't understand why do does. Everyone likes Suvorov so much, but not him. So he went to a soldier and said, well, why do you like Suvorov so much? And he said, well, the Suvorov sleeps with a soldier like everyone on a camp bed, not in the, not in the tent like you generals. So the general, he took his warmest coat, and from then on, he slept in the, in the bunks with, with the soldiers on a camp bed. His back hurt, but he believed, I'll become like Suvorov. But they still didn't like him. So he went to the soldier again and asked, well... What else is why you love Suvorov so much? And he said, well, Suvorov, it's the porridge with us, not as you in the field ki kitchen with the cook. Mm -hmm. So he stopped eating the cook food and went to the campfire and sat with the soldiers and then ate the porridge. Didn't like it, but he hated believing, I'll be just like Suvorov. But still, nobody liked him. Mm -hmm. And he went, and he again went to the soldier and asked, well, what else? What is the sacred secret of why everyone likes Suvorov so much? And he said, Suvorov fights the enemy like he's a soldier, not like he's a fat general. And the general couldn't do that, and that's why he remained unknown, whereas Suvorov is the national hero. It's leadership by example is exactly what it is. That's uh, what we do, whether you're an officer in the military or you're a teacher in a school. Um, as a teacher, I'm, I'm a servant leader. I, we The school has its mission. I have... I have people I have to answer to. I have to answer to Mr. Rosberg. I have to answer to uh, Mr. Clover. Um, but at the same time, um, I've got 50, 60, 70 students under me that are relying on me to, um, to, to help them along and my, my job. And, and that's the thing is you'll always have one foot in both camps, my loyalty up, my loyalty down. And I think some people forget that loyalty is like electricity. It flows in both directions. If you want your soldiers or you want your students to trust you, and everything is foundation of, of trust, is that they, that, that's a hard thing to gain. 
and a very easy thing to lose. And I have, I have dug my heels in um, um, with, with, um, with the administration of the school. I dug in my heels in the military and said, no, this is not right. This is not what I, but at the same time, when the soldiers realize that you, you are there to support them and you care for them, just like students, they'll do anything for you. And they said, okay, we got to do this. It's, 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 a bad, it's a bad lot. We drew a bad lot. But at least I trust you that you're not just going to waste, you know, waste our lives, waste our time. And that's, it, it doesn't matter where you're at. Um, there's always someone above you. There's always someone below you. And you have to stay loyal mm -hmm. to, uh, both, sides. to both sides. And you're, you're caught in the middle. If you side too much with the soldiers, you're, well, you know, the mission doesn't get done. It, they, they call it mission versus man, not to be sexist, but mission versus the man. Um, the, um, you've got to think about your soldiers, but you've got to think about your commanders too because they're expecting you to lead. And your soldiers will do anything if they trust you. Students will do anything if they trust you. Um, mm -hmm. But we do have to, you do have to dig in every so often on both. Sometimes you've seen it in class. Sometimes I have to dig my heels in. And other times I've had to dig my heels in with the administration and say what we're doing here is wrong and we need to change. And that's, um, I, uh, when I was in training, I was a young second lieutenant and I had a major, Danny Drew. I'd follow him through the gates of hell. He's the kind of guy, um, great officer. And I was sighting my platoon, we were mechanized, so we had four armored vehicles. But he was, I, wanted your, I want your medium machine gun here to do this. And what he was asking me to do wasn't possible. And so I moved the gun and he came back to look at my defensive position. It was a blocking position, really what it was. And he said, why did you move the gun? And I said to him, because what you wanted me to do with this, I couldn't do it. It was a test. Mm -hmm. Can you say truth to power? He will, people will put you in an impossible situation and you need to say no. no. You, you have to. You need to be able to say no because that's one of the skills of, in life, being able to say no and don't feel like you're betraying the whole country and the world. And some people will respect you for it. Some um, people will, some hate, people you will it. hate you for it. They expect you to be obedient and do exactly what you're told. But with, with Dan Drew, I knew he was testing me. And he was like, good. And they do this all the time because they want you. Because in, in combat, if he was my company commander, he could be killed. And I could be the lead platoon. I could take over the company right from, you know, he, he knows. And that's the idea is that you're always training the people below you to take over. Now, of course, teaching is not the same, the idea, but the principles are, are sound. That was great. I believe we're going to move into the conclusion part of our interview today. Hope it hasn't been too boring for you. <laughs> I hope it hasn't been too boring for the audience. I've been thrilled to <laughs> speak with a person. Well, we have great conversations. We have great though. conversation. Yeah. And all in all, this is one of the first things that I'm recording as an interviewer, not as the cameraman. Mm. A bit of advice to our fellow viewers. I would please ask you to recommend them three movies and three musical performers of your choice that you find valuable oh. to you that have either given you something or that you'd recommend to a person to look at enough for inspiration or morale? I love films. I've watched thousands of films, I mean, good films. Um, the, uh, I could give you a list, a massive list of rec recommendations. One of my um, favorite films is actually The English Patient. It came out in 95, and it's based in historical events as well, but it's, it's a historical fiction. But uh, that one is, is about, the, you know, love is endless. Um, and it's very, very romantic. But also, um, so that's one of my favorite films. The, um, I also like Dr. Strangelove. Mm. It's uh, Stanley Kubrick's film about the Cold War. It's a very, very intelligent, uh, humorous look at the bomb. About, it was set in, the, it was actually filmed around the same time as Kennedy was assassinated. But it's, uh, it's all in black and white. It's Peter Sellers. And it's, it's a very subtle uh, humor. It's not slapstick humor. It's actually, in fact, quite intelligent humor. So Dr. Strangelove, Stanley Kubrick. Do Dr. Strangelove. And the first one was? The English Patient. The English Patient. And uh, sometimes 
I did it last night. Uh, sometimes you just don't want to think. And uh, so I watched, uh, I wouldn't, well, this is a good movie, The Replacements. It's a, it's a football movie. It's a comedy. Um, but actually, <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I watched uh, You Don't Mess With the Zohan. Oh, You Don't Mess With the Zohan. Oh, that's And it was, uh, that was just like one. complete, utter mind candy. Like if you just want to shut your brain off. So I think when it comes to films, I think it's absolutely important that you, um, that you, 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 you watch the film that you're in the mood for. If you're in the mood for a comedy, watch a comedy. If you're in the mood for, for, for romance, watch a romance. But get yourself a list of very good films and, and watch them over and over and over again. There's, there's some films I could watch for, for, I could watch, I've watched hundreds of times and I just love those films. You know, one of those films is Top Gun, 1986. It's one of my all-time favorites. It's, it doesn't make you feel too much. And it's just a straight mm -hmm. action. I'm just sad that COVID has actually um, delayed the release of the second Top Gun film. We've been waiting 30, Wait. 30 years for this film. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's usual Mr. Zemo. I ask him for three movies, and he gives me six. Yeah, absolutely. That's no problem. I can give you hundreds of I know. films. We sp we spend so much time in TOK watching films, and yeah. all the films I'm going to show you are probably films you've never seen. Maybe like 60% of them. Yeah. What about musical performers? Oh, music? As in music or as in uh, musicals? Music as in music. Oh, well, I, um, with the exception of, you know, maybe I'm being prejudiced here, but with the exception of a few songs, I think music died at the end of the 80s. So, uh, but music is also, uh, I love music from the 80s and, and, and back. So, but um, <clears throat> I, I love listening to the old 80s music because that's when I was a, a teenager. So it just brings back nostalgia. But what kind of the 80s, like the beginning of the new wave of British heavy metal or something a bit easier? Yeah, more the, uh, I, every... Almost every 80s song brings back a memory for when I was growing up. And so it's, um, I, I listen to a lot of stuff. Like a lot of really good bands came out of my hometown, Harlequin and, and groups like that. And they just, it, just listen to everything from the 80s. But also I, I love the, the Clash and the Cure, um, the, uh, the, English, uh, the English bands. But every... Every one of these bands and these groups that came out of the 80s brings back some sort of memory from when I was, um, uh, whether it's a Canadian group. So it's hard to recommend one specific group because when you're in a nostalgic mood and you, you, you're listening to um, Tragically Hip, which is a Canadian group, and it, it just brings back memories. Uh, you know, those, uh, those fantastic. We, my wife and I both love uh, movies, um, music from the 30s and 40s. Interesting. We love setting... Um, um, an atmosphere at home uh, where we can just sit there and we read our books and we listen to music and we don't even have to talk. It's so we love, I've always loved music from the 30s and the 40s. Um, that's always been uh, great to me. And then, of course, um, I do love classical music. Uh, it depends on the mood, though. Beethoven, if you're in a bad mood, mm -hmm. um, very much so. If you're in a triumphant mood, Tchaikovsky is always mm -hmm. great for. Uh, for, and then if you're just in a, if you're in a reflective mood, um, it's Mozart. It's absolutely. Um, well, the, the Papa classics, yeah, so to say. Exactly. So. And then it's probably going to be the last one for today. I want to make this a tradition for our podcast. I'm going to ask you to give our viewers one advice about life, one advice that you feel valuable after living a life full of emotions and experience. Hmm. I think it's absolutely critical that you enjoy what you're doing. You need to, um, you need to love, you know, you need to love everything, you know, and, and don't be afraid of, of, of being emotional. It's okay to have emotions. We're humans after all, but find something you love. Now, you're not going to love everything you've done in your life. Find hobbies um, that, that have, not everything's about money. Not everything's about power. Not everything's about. It's about doing those things for yourself that make that make you happy. That other people might not understand why you do it, but it, uh, you know, find your happiness is and and find your little corner of happiness. If you like to paint, some of the greatest people through history, paint were painters. 
you know, and they did it on, they did that. Uh, Churchill loved to paint. Um, Roosevelt loved to paint. Um, and it was like, it was a escapism. Just get away from, and, and don't take it so seriously. You're not going to get out of it alive anyway. <laughs> Number four. <laughs> <laughs> Almost a golden five. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that this long story has been short enough for you to grasp <laughs> the whole magnificent personality of the person that's sitting in front of me right now. I'd please ask you to spread this video among your friends, maybe those who want to learn about interesting people. And the truth is, it's not so hard to, finding, to find an interesting person around you. Just start talking. Mr. Zemel, thank you very much for coming. Nice I hope girl. that this interview is going to lay a solid foundation for what's going to become, I hope, the tradition of the ISK podcast. Any wishes on the future guests? Um, well, I think, I think what's more important is you're going to be graduating in a year from now, becoming close to be finishing in a year from now. And I think it's really important that you, you, you've done a lot of great things for the school. We've talked about that. You need to leave a legacy. You need to find someone in the next grade who's going to carry on these traditions. And the only way that these traditions, these can become traditions for ISK is if there are willing people. So you need to start looking at, uh, keep, you know, talk to all the teachers, talk to all the staff, not just the foreign teachers. I think the Russian teachers are also very interesting as well. We don't get a chance to talk to them as much as we want to and, and work with them. And they have a different perspective on things. So definitely, you, you want to try and cover all of the staff uh, as, as much as you can. But uh, make sure you bring some people on board with this. Um, Vladislav's on his way out. You've got a year left. Find some grade tens that that want to do this and keep it going because that's the only way it'll become a tradition. Is if if more people you, you don't want this to die with with you leaving. So look for somebody in the in the younger grades is going to carry on all the great work that you've been doing. Thank you very much, Mr. Zemo. Once again. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure.